I wanted fame so bad at like 20. What my success means to me now is much, it's radically different than what it was when I was younger. What does fulfillment mean to you now? Every time I take a breath, everything in the universe is working in service to have me draw from that source. To understand that, that is, that's the first step to understand that our life is actually at the mercy of everything around us. During this time, like what do I do? I don't want to get a billion dollars and be like, okay, I get to retire at 30. I, I didn't right. come here to retire, I came here to work. You know, I, I came here to to live. You can't just live just sitting down and doing nothing. When I realized that was God, I saw a word and I realized I was being spoken to. I trembled. It's like I saw creation for what it was. Do you have any message to young artists? That's Christian Gates, better known as the Philharmonic, a multi-talented artist from Sacramento blending hip-hop, soul, and R&B to create his own genre of music that has global respect from the music community. He recently won NPR's Tiny Desk Concert Competition, a highly prestigious award in the music industry. This is a personal autobiographical interview with Christian, talking through his life story, his origin story in a sense, his personal adversities, his philosophies and morals in life and in his music, and he just, it's one of the most beautiful interviews I've filmed. This guy's brain opens up and lets out wisdom that you just didn't know people have walking around there. So you're gonna see why he's successful and why he deserves everything that's happening to him and everything that's coming, because this guy is exploding. Welcome to Vibe with Humanity. This is a platform for authentic stories of overcoming adversity, and I hope you enjoy hearing from Christian, because I sure did. I was actually reaching a critical point where I was like, if something does not happen this year, I'm going to walk away from this. Oh, really? Yeah. So it got, yeah, you, wow, man. You had some serious adversity leading up right before it, right? And kind yeah. of the city had your back, and people supported you, and I, the video's on your Instagram. Check it out at the Philharmonic, right? Yeah. And of you winning it. It's just, I, I get goosebumps thinking about it. It's so genuine and just like your sound. But anyways, I cut you off, man. I, I'm a legitimately big fan. I, I love what you're doing. So I'm glad that that happened to you. So you didn't quit. <laughs> yeah. It was, and you know, I never thought it would happen textbook to me because you hear mm. a, a whole bunch of stories of people that literally have the, the same type of happenings before a breakthrough mm -hmm. where you're, you're like about to break down you know <laughs> yeah. and um uh, i was about to break down you what know? was it what was the hardest part like what, what were the challenges leading up to that um so actually a year to the announcement so i got the announcement on may 8th mm -hmm. uh, of this year that i won the tiny desk on the last year's date on the same day uh-huh um, I got into a total lost car accident with a brand new car that I bought two months earlier. Oh. And I was using this car to pay my bills because I was doing Uber at the time. And so I didn't have a lot of clients like production because I do a lot of music production and, and um, recording for other artists and and for other people who aspire to do great things in music. And so you were covering it with Uber and then yeah. you lost the ability to do that? Oh, yeah. that's brutal. Because, you know, when you're working with musicians, uh, you know, the seasons are very volatile. Mm. It, there's not a consistency mm. um, with clientele all the time, you know, and of course. And therefore income. Right. Yeah. And of course, you're dealing with a lot of people, including myself, where <laughs> the money is just not there. <laughs> so, <laughs> Starving artists. <laughs> right. Right. And so, In many you know, forms. <laughs> so, you know, you got to diversify the hustle a little bit mm -hmm. and uber was that outlet for me and so i when i got this new car i was elated because it was the first car i've ever bought even though i've been very blessed with cars mm -hmm. um throughout my 20s i've been gifted um two cars and they were both oh three corollas one was a manual and one was an automatic perfect right <laughs> and uh i was able to uh get from point a to point b whenever i needed to um, That's all we asked for. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so when when I got into this car accident, you know, and I was just at an intersection in uh, in Natomas, and the person wasn't looking, and they didn't even approach the red the the stop sign, and I had the right of way, mm -hmm. and they t boned my car. What side, passenger or driver? Passenger. Oh. Both doors caved in, couldn't open. 
Really? And that's they, a hard hit then. It, it was a really hard hit. Airbags deployed on the passenger side. Did you get hurt? Uh, no, I was very flustered though. Yeah. It was just an intense moment in that way. People checked it to see if I was okay. Mm. But the driver attempted to run off, tried to hit and run. And then there was a person in the neighborhood who I'm grateful for that made made sure they followed him. Oh, wow. Not just got his plate, but actually like chased him down. Yeah, got her plates. And it's just like, she came back. Did she panic or something? Or what, was she drunk? Um, she didn't know. I don't know what it was. I mm, think- Just panicked. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, because in that in that situation, I think that's pretty um, a valid response, you know. Yeah, we'll give her the benefit of that. Right. <laughs> but at the time, I sure didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so, God, it's that's sitting. brutal, dude. So what are you thinking? Like, okay, lost my side hustle income. Everything else is hit and miss. I'm done with this stuff in a year. I mean, did you go through any depression or anything like that? Oh yeah, I, I definitely did. I did. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And. It, it was like one of those things that it didn't really hit immediately because I had a lot of gigs during the summer season. And mm -hmm. usually that's when a lot of the, the money comes in for music. But when it started to hit the fall and winter seasons, I really started to feel it. Mm -hmm. And every month leading up to NPR's Tiny Desk was just getting more and more brutal. Mm -hmm. So I really was like hustling, trying to figure out a way um, luckily I, I made it in, but I started falling behind two, three months on like all of my bills, my studio rent, my house rent, my car rent, my car bill, maxed out all my credit cards. Couldn't, oh, couldn't move at all. Dude, like, that's pressure. That is pressure. That is serious pressure on you at all times. That's not something you can shake off. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let me just keep that in the back of my mind. It doesn't work like that with finance pressure. Man. No, I'm you got to take care of it now and yeah. then. <laughs> wow. So that's, uh. That's a heavy time leading up. So, what, what do you think the hardest point was of that whole thing? Like, do you have a moment where you're just like, dude, I can't do this anymore? And, and how did you get get through that? I think, like, the moment where I said something's got to give here because I feel like like I was at the point where I was so behind. Mm. I was like, they're probably gonna repo my car. I'm I'm about I'm at that three month mark. When you're at that three month mark. You know, I'm looking out my window every day to see yeah. if, if the tow truck's out there. I'm waking up earlier than I usually do. You Move know, the cars. I'm moving the car. <laughs> I'm like just looking around, you yeah. know. And wow. um, that was a hard point. And also, like, f during when the tiny desk was announced for the contest, I had to, to really ask for help because I didn't have any money at all. Mm. And I had this really big vision for how I wanted to execute it. And it was just a lot of phone calls, a lot of planning and meetings and execution. And everybody showed up and everybody was willing and, and um, all city homes, they provided me the venue for two to three days straight, which is absolutely unheard of. That's so generous. Right. That's awesome. Beyond generous. It's, it's, it's just, it's unreal. It's, it's like, it's what was needed to happen. Cause mm. for the first day I just needed to set it up because it was a really, really, um, detailed schematic that yeah. was in my brain. And so I was like, okay, I need everybody here and here and here and here. And then I also need to set up all the mics get the lighting right. So I had the videographer come yeah, in Yeah, that's the next for day. sure a day. And yeah. then and then we had the dress rehearsal, it, taking pictures, making sure everything was right, making sure the camera looked right. And then on the last day, we had the performance. Wow. <laughs> that's so cool, man. Yeah. Well, take me back to childhood a little bit. Cleveland, Ohio, right? I'm, I'm just, how does life make a philharmonic from a Christian Gates. And by the way, awesome name, Swiss mm -hmm. Army. You are kind of a Swiss Army knife of music. And I know you picked that name to represent kind of you, right? Because mm -hmm. you can play so many instruments and stuff. And so tell me a little bit about your childhood. So I grew up in Cleveland from about, you know, infant to six, seven years old. Okay. Uh, my mom moved out here, met my sister's father and and had a baby and got, had my sister. And so we had to move out here for that. Um, so from seven on, I've been in Sacramento and I've lived out here. I've learned the majority of my music out here. But uh, my mom actually started my music in, in Cleveland when uh, 
she took me to a concert and I had no musical background hmm. at the time. And um, after the concert, I come home and I start playing one of the melodies on the piano. This is according to her. And she's like, okay, he has a gift for music. Well, I and believe so, it. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm going to put him in lessons. And so she put me in lessons. So the person I had lessons with was the pianist for the Cleveland Orchestra at the time. Mm. So from 6 to 12 years old, even when we moved to California, I was really diligent in being consistent with classical piano. So uh, practicing, at diligent as in taking the lessons and then practicing at home and yeah. stuff like that? Wow. And so it felt a lot more like a discipline than something that was fun. You know, it's fun. David Garibaldi, he was just on and he talked about that. He said, you know, being a creative for a living is a privilege, but I don't think people understand how much discipline is involved. Right. So it sounds like you share that as well. Oh, it, for real. It's it's in the beginning, especially when you're learning any type of skill, mm -hmm. the discipline to become good at it is always going to be not that fun <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah but it still did it still give you that feeling like oh i just love this to to make it worth it to get through learning all of that so when you start learning the pieces and you start playing them and you start playing them faster and then over time you begin to hear these things in its entire form and you hear yourself becoming better that's where the excitement comes in mm. or there's a song you hear and you want to learn it and you take the time to learn it. And that's where the joy comes in. And you get the inspiration to keep wanting to do it. We, you know, that was how it was for me, where it's like, okay, I want to learn Furry Lease because this is the song everybody knows. Mm. So I learned it. I want to learn Claire de Lune. So I learned it. It was like, okay, the process was, was beautiful at times and it was hard at times because there were certain parts of the song where I was like, I can't get mm -hmm. uh, the right fingers on the right keys <laughs> for this so you know it it was a lot of um it was just a lot of just time mm. and you have to really give yourself time you you can't look at, at it like oh i want to be this overnight you know you have to be so focused on i want to just learn this piece the process yes uh -huh. okay and so you guys you got to love it to get through that exactly and you played in church choirs and stuff, right? And I did. Well, not church choir. My mom had me in a community choir. She started, okay. she was very, very active in making sure I had a lot of involvement in a lot of activities uh, just to diversify my palate. Because, you know, when you're growing up in the world and there's so many things you can do in the world, you have to be able to not only survive, but to thrive. And the only way to do that is to learn how to, how to like you know how do i put it you have to to learn many skills and find, whatever to find what you're best at yeah is, not okay. only what you're best at what you're passionate at sometimes Ooh, i like that or like you know or that was it the Iki guy uh um, is that a philosopher or something and it, it's a philosophy oh okay where it's like what you like to do what the world needs i forgot what the other part of it is, but it's like a mesh of all three happening at once hmm. is uh, really where uh, you find your quote unquote purpose and what you're your supposed dharma to. Your yeah. dharma or whatever. Yeah. Dude, yeah. that's rad. So your mom was just exposing you to all kinds of stuff and, yeah. you, and you found it. Yep. Sports. Hmm. Like you learn the, the power of principle with like discipline. You learn like for me, like sports is where I learned the discipline. I don't like running and doing conditioning. <laughs> I don't like, you know, I didn't like exercising. I didn't like the feeling of it. Mm -hmm. Still don't. <laughs> <laughs> the feeling of exercise sucks, man. I know some people like it, but I, I like the after effects. Right. So. so the after effects of it. And of course, like there's a price that happens over time. You know, it happens with life. You know, with life comes death and, and life is about balance and that's what the balance looks like like so you mm. you have to be able to everything has a good thing and a bad thing to it mm. you know every lesson every elevation every hardship has a bad thing to it and a good thing to it or you don't even have to look at it that way it just could be uh, things that are hard for you and things that are easy for you and things that are enjoyable for you and not so enjoyable 
Hmm. And so I look at I look at life through that lens, through that Libra scale, through everything that I do. So you look for balance between, say, pain, pain and pleasure. Exactly. Instead of just too much pleasure or too much pain, you're trying to find the happy medium. Exactly. That's kind of where, I mean, the medium is where the beauty of life is kind of in everything. So to your point, I think balance is a good philosophy, if you will, to to look to utilize in all activities. Yeah. That's awesome, man. At what point did uh, hip hop come in and start influencing you? You know, it's funny. I was never allowed to listen to hip hop as a kid. Really? Yeah. My mom would not let me listen to it. Huh. My first intro to hip hop was on the radio when I would go to my neighbor's house and they would play it on the radio. And I really liked it. I liked everything about it. I liked the rebelliousness of it, the rebelliousness of like just the content. Mm -hmm. Even if it wasn't uh, morally sound, <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. it, was, it was rebellious. And, it, and, you know, when you tell me I can't do something, the first thing that I want to do mm -hmm. <laughs> is do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. when I started listening to that on the radio, uh, I was gifted uh, MP3 a little later. So I would record the rap songs on this MP3 um while they appeared on the radio and i had like 21 songs that I could only fit on there because it didn't have enough so memory. a sneaky album <laughs> yes yeah, <laughs> <sneaky awesome>. <laughs> and uh i was also on need for speed underground i was listening okay. to lil john and the east side boys mm -hmm. just like every day <laughs> <laughs> i remember that shit <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, was, it was um there was a point where every bar that you go into everywhere people are screaming shot 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 right <laughs> to the window yes yes <laughs> <laughs> that was mine and so like that was what was on need for speed underground this was like back in 03 04. Mm. Yeah, so I was like 10, 11 years old and really trying to expose myself to it. And during high school, that's when, you know, I, I met other people that were rapping mm. and everybody was on Fruity Loops at the school. <laughs> so Fruity Loops is a producer program where people make beats. And it was very, very simple to make beats at the time on hmm. That program and so, so are, they, are they like quality or good enough? Like well, they're good enough to rap on them. There but you go. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't say good enough by any other metric though. Yeah. Right on. And how did that, how did that influence your music? When I started making beats, I figured out on my keyboard how to record, and so I used like all five of the recording modules and put it together to make a song, and then. That's how I started producing. And then after that, I started rapping over the beats mm. and I wanted to be a rapper. And so my friend um, at the time, he had his father had a studio at his house in Davis. And I went to go make my first song there, which was wild. How old were you at that 16. time? OK, yeah. so dang. Yeah, you've been you've been going for it, making music. That's yeah. awesome. When did you first know, like, because at 23, you kind of had an event that made you really want to pursue it full time. At what point did you know, like, I'm, I'm going for this? Like, so the, the event that really made me like go for it was my grandfather's passing at 22. I was doing a lot of work in the Christian industry at the time. Mm. And so that one rocked my world and, and it just, I, it kind of shattered my faith. Oh, really? Yeah. Were you close to him? Uh, yeah, I was very, Obviously. very much. Yeah. And so I was dealing with, um, a producer at the time who was, um, who was paying me, um, to make music. And so I was grateful for the fact that I got to make music full time, but I mean, I was making a beat every day and getting a very, very low amount every month. So I was cool with that, but, uh, I just asked for a favor where I was like, I need to go see my grandfather. Cause he had a heart attack two months before. And I was mm -hmm. like, some tell me, I was just like, I gotta go see him. Oh, and, intuition. Uh, yeah, it was the intuition. It's like, I got to go see him. Hmm. And uh, yeah, the the producer I was working for kept promising me that I could do it. Even And I said, I'll work while I'm there if I need to. And he kept promising me. He said he'd buy the tickets, and he never bought the tickets. And so like a month later, my grandfather died. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that is devastating, man. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I... So, like my my relationship with Christianity and and at that point was very, I, I dealt with a lot of like bad experiences. Like with, what? When I was in Oakland, it was so the pastor he was a cult leader, he used a lot of like word of faith ministry, prosperity gospel, okay. things of that nature. Where it was like you do this and you'll get this. Okay, you so know? faith from good works, yeah. good works type stuff. 
it, it would, I wouldn't even say from good works. It was more like the, the belief okay. mechanism. And so, but that wasn't really the issue. He was, he was more like a very controlling cult leader. Anything he says, he needs to be done. Okay. Yeah. So his interpretation of the Bible is the only way he's not open he, to hearing. Right. No. Okay. That's, and a, then, that's a problem. Also, he was, um, <laughs> he was a predator. And so, you know, um, that was that experience. And then the producer experience in the Christian industry, I was like, I, I was like, if I'm having this consistency here, I don't know if I want to, mm. I don't like this. What was that conversation like with, was it with you and God? Like just, Hey man, I, I don't know what you are. I don't know what Christianity is. Like, tell me about that moment when you questioned that. Well, it was like, at that point I, I was looking, I was like, this can't be real. Hmm. This entire thing it can't be. It's, 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 I was like, this is, this is what the Bible says. And this is how these people are acting. And these are two separate things. And I'm like, they're, but they're using this to justify what they're doing. And so, and I'm like, I'm watching this pattern happen. And, you know, at 22, 23, it was like, okay, I started reading the Gnostic Gospels. I started mm -hmm. moving away from it to find a justification to be like, hey, I, I don't want to be locked in this cage because I, you know, I didn't get out. I didn't do anything. I was following it to the best of my ability. And I just had my face shattered after that moment. I was like, this is, and so I became an atheist for like five, six years. Wow. I said, there is no God at mm. all. <laughs> so, wow, that's crazy because when you're breaking out of that religious sense, essentially you're going to hell if you do that. And so you're just like, screw it, I don't care. Yeah, yeah it was just like that that moment was so hard, mm. I think, because it's like I lost literally my life. I lost my community. I lost Oh, so yeah, because you were essentially in a cult, right? Yeah, that I does start. Yeah, that does come with community and, you know, a lot of stuff is taken care of when it comes to your social life and family and things like that. So you got hit with <laughs> the guy was a predator. You lose community. Your grandpa dies. Your yeah. Christian boss wouldn't let you go see him. That's that's terrible. That's a that's gonna shift life for you. So yeah. I can see how you went atheist. Are you still atheist? No. Or how did that? No, no. What happened? Tell me about that moment where you. But are you religious now? Um, I wouldn't say religious, but I, I definitely believe in God. Yeah. And, and I found God and I talked to God and God talks Dude, to tell me. tell me about that. Hell yeah. I um, want to hear that. That was um, very interesting because it started off with like, I was struggling heavy with addiction probably. Mm. Um, so I, I lost this contest in 2019 before I went on tour with Hobo Johnson. This was before I even knew that I was going to go on tour. And so I was really devastated by the loss of this contest that I really wanted to win. Mm. And uh, I got second place. And so you still get a prize in second place. But for me, second place is not mm. good enough, mm. you know. So I it was I was going to work with James Poison from The Roots and, and go to New York and make a song. And it was going to be, it was, it was That's fun. a break. It, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so when I lost that contest, it was like, Dang, I don't think I'm focused enough. Mm. So let me try doing this Adderall. Okay. So, because I was diagnosed with ADHD at a very young age. And when, at 11 years old, though, back, you know, in 04, because my grades were slipping, because I was really, I was just in a different environment where uh, I was just out of my environment. Um, I, my school life, my childhood wasn't fun in that way. Uh, I was made fun of for my weight. Really? And, yeah, all the time. So you got bullied? All the time. Really? Yeah. Dude, that's so brutal. Yeah. The bullying stuff and the developmental years like that. How did that impact you? Um, I think in every way. I think, though, it, it what pressed me to do music, like really pursue it. Like during lunch in high school, oh, like I, dude. instead of like going out to play basketball and doing these things, I was in the MIDI class thanks oh, to I my teachers. Do you think it was helping you channel like negative emotions and pain oh, and stuff oh, like yeah. that? Oh yeah. That's incredible. So you're going through bullying and you ended up finding an outlet. Like life could have been very different if you didn't. That, you know? Yeah. That, like, what yeah. if you had no outlet for that? Bullying I do not want to know. I would be a menace to society. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So 2019 yeah. lost the contest. You had, Hey, I should probably look at Adderall. Is that, is that what got you? The stimulants? Yeah. The Did stimulants. it start with Adderall and 
Yeah, no, it kept on, it kept going with it, and so it's it was really good at first. I started, then I won a contest because of it, mm. and then on tour, I was abusing it at that point. So it started off with the re regular dose, and then it started increasing, and then I started going be beyond the dose. And like at the worst of it, I was taking 120 milligrams a day. Oh dang! And you know the max for that is 40. Yeah. So I'm taking three days worth of doses in one day <laughs> what happens when it runs out like you call the doctor make something up or oh i wasn't calling doc i would never got it from a doctor oh okay. I, I got it from okay. people who had prescriptions yeah. i had got it from people who were selling it just in the music industry that stuff's there if you want it right right i mean it's not even in the music industry it's like it's at the time it was just I, I knew street dealers and okay. all sorts of stuff. Like, okay. I'm surprised. Like, they're, I've done stupid things <laughs> in my life. <laughs> like, but. Um, That's the stupidest one. Yeah, this is, this is by far. Because okay. we were, I'll, I'll give you a story. We, okay. were, on, we were on tour. Mm -hmm. And I brought that thing with me on tour while we were going through the country. I had my drummer, Courtney, who's with me now. Okay. And I had Sean, um, who's. You know, he's a member of the family and he helps me out on my merch and he's helping out on this tour with the merch. We're in the middle of the NPR tour right now. But um, we were traveling through Mississippi and I had about like 12, 13 pills. I'm at the point where, you know, you, you can either get caught with possession and then you can get caught with possession with the intent to sell. And yeah. at that point, I was caught with. I wasn't caught, thank God, I would not be here. Mm -hmm. But I had enough to be caught with possession with intent to sell. Oh, no, no, you know <laughs> Right. <laughs> so we get pulled over in Mississippi. Oh, shit. And they ask the search. And it's the, Mississippi? And it's Mississippi. Oh, no. It's Mississippi out of all places. <laughs> oh. <laughs> with California license plates and all that, we were Target. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I had I had it in my bag. I, I was looking for for a long time where to hide it. And what nationality are you? I'm black, white, and native. Oh, okay. I'm like, so different is a mutt. Yeah, so so different than what they're used to in Mississippi. We'll You're, just leave that there. Right. <laughs> but then I'm still, you know, I'm still like recognizable. It's like, you ain't one of us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, it, it was that moment. You know, I, I just didn't understand the gravity of my actions until mm. that moment. I was like, holy crap, dude. I'm about to get everybody in trouble here off of this. Mm. And that was like, they searched the entire car and didn't find it. Dang. I give well, them that's my a CD. blessing. Yeah. God was working. For sure. We need your music, man. Right. It feels good. God was working. <laughs> and uh, did you continue doing Adderall after that? No, my drummer, really? my drummer went in my face. Mm. We, we, and that was it. He said, don't ever do that shit again. Throw that shit down the toilet right now. And you did? And I did. And you're still with that drummer? Yeah. Mother, I love that, dude. No, he, was, he was in the right. He was in the for right sure. for, the, for the entire time. I was, I was selfish, mm. uh, ignorant. So it was just like, you know. But that didn't that that wasn't even the end of my saga at all. That was that was the, the, the I of, got back from tour. Uh -huh. I ordered like a hundred pills. Oh shit! Okay, <laughs> like <laughs> it's like for the for the red. I, I was I'm a stubborn idiot Dude, sometimes. Yeah. So that was and that started a two year just a runner binge. Okay. Yeah, I made a whole entire album on it. I have not released it. Okay. <laughs> when you listen to it now, is it like cringe? Or are you out on it? Or are you thinking of releasing yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's cringe. It's like, okay. it's really cringe. Okay. And it, it was very psychosis, very political. Mm, okay. Things that I, I feel that don't reflect who I am. And so there was a point where it got so bad, I almost lost my mind one night. And, you know, on it, uh, the the way that I got introduced to God was actually through it, because hmm. I started seeing the synchronizing numbers that everybody's starting to see. Mm. Eleven, eleven, and three, three, three. And yeah, I feel like that's a lot of people's introduction to mm. being able to talk to God. Mm. It's really it, it, synchronicities. Yeah, right? yeah. And so I started seeing that, and then I started seeing words, and that was words where. 
just repeating words and everywhere like license plates things yeah. of that nature um it's hard to talk about but sure, <laughs> you know sure. well because it's sat to other people that haven't had the experience crazy. it does i'm actually on board with that with synchronicities and understanding that there are no coincidences right. humans are connected there's a there's a plan like you know you get what you put out i'm there with you but then for people hearing that, you know, it's possibly drug induced. And then also I'm learning how to, I, I totally get the trepidation and talking about it, but continue. Yeah. But when I realized that was God, that was a scary ass moment. Mm. What was the exact moment where that hit you? Like, what? I saw a word and I realized I was being spoken to. Mm. And I can't, I don't want to go too much into detail sure. about it. But when I saw it, I said, I trembled mm. and I, you know, now a lot of the Bible makes sense where huh. I'm like, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, you know, you know, God's like, it's okay, dude. It's like, you're good. I'm like, I am I, <laughs> <laughs> am I, <laughs> it doesn't feel like it right now. I'm like, Oh man, I could get crushed by this entity. And it, it just, I don't know what it was. It just all came together. Like every, everything that I saw, Wow. It all came together. I saw it's like I saw creation for what it was. Mm. At least for my eyes. I don't know if I see it for the entirety for you know in God's glory. I don't know. Enough I for you to break the atheism. We all, you know? yeah, for, That's, for, however that happens is awesome because I do believe there is a God. <laughs> I mean and, and I think he's talking to all of us all the time. And I think you need to find how he's talking to you. Yeah. You mentioned you hear from him. How how do you hear from him now? Um you Still, just, numbers, words, and, yeah, yeah, numbers and words, and that's how he he doesn't really talk much. He, he's more of a doer. Mm. So, you Expand know, I ask for that. something. I ask for something. Um, of course, God is not a genie, you know. But for me, it's God rewards those who do the work, and you know that's what life is. You're going to be doing the work. Mm. Do the work in everything, whether it's at your work with yourself. Um, working on your health, working in your relationships. You're always working on improving. It's just, you, you know, doing the work. Hmm. And, you know, that's where I, I talk to God is about the work and saying, hi, I want this, but I want this for this reason. Well, and the reason is like to help others or to, yeah. is that the primary, the, that is such a common commonality in successful people. Is So, the biggest the biggest revelation was was actually when i had nothing god wanted to show me something about like what what the true intention of my purpose was and it's like when everybody came together for me and and to make this happen i realized in that moment why my gift was given to me hmm. it wasn't to make sure or make me feel like I'm going to reach this place because, you know, at the end of the day, it's vanity. And once you reach that place, you've already evolved to the point where that doesn't satisfy you. Yes. And you know, yes. that's, that's, and neither is impressive because you had to do it step by step. Right. You know, it's not a surprise. Like, and, yeah. And so like what it taught me is, is that I got to see deeper into life because with a lot of this, it's like, we like to talk about, um, how we, you know, we got to work for it and the results that I get, you know, I deserve these things. I don't feel like I deserve anything. Hmm. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, I feel narratives that are going around, which I, I do people, I do respect the work of people, but I feel there is a lack of compassion, um, that exists overall with, with the narrative surrounding, um, the work. What narrative specifically what work and where do you see the lack of compassion? That's way too many parts in one question. Sorry. But. No, it's, I think when it comes to the notion of prosperity or the notion of being financially well, okay, I think there's an art to it. I think that some people are, a lot of people are exploited for the work that they, they do and aren't appreciated for that work. Hmm. And, you know, and they say, well, that's your responsibility if you don't appreciate it. I believe to a certain extent that that is true. But I feel that people's work should be honored and not exploited. And I, and we know when there's a lot of people saying, I feel exploited in doing this and I don't feel like, and I'm trying my best and I can't get this raise. Mm -hmm. I'm trying my best and I'm not getting paid enough. 
you know, I, I feel like there's a validity to it. And for sure. And there's a lot of people working 40 that can't pay their rent and working super hard and, and still aren't meeting. It's, that's a tough situation. It is. And I, I feel like, you know, this is, that, that was for me what I realized in, in the service is that every time I take a breath, everything in the universe is working in service to have me draw from that source. Mm. And to know, to understand that, that is, that's the first step to understand that our life is actually at the mercy of everything around us. Mm. We're working together. We're part of something, right? Yeah, is that exactly. What you mean? Yeah. So mm. when I draw this breath, it's because the trees are converting Boom. carbon dioxide into oxygen. The sun mm -hmm. is shining. The temperature is right. Mm -hmm. the, the rain is showing up at a certain time. <laughs> and all of these things are working together in service to give me breath. And that gives you humility or allows you to be compassionate to others? What do you, what do you think? It, I understand what my mission is, is to continue that energy. Mm. And so if this is giving me breath and I can't waste my breath saying, oh, me, 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 I, 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 I. Mm. You know what I mean? This is what I want and this is what I need. And of course, it's harder said than done because I still do it. Oh, yeah, of course, but, man. The spiritual ego is the biggest battle right. of any man. <laughs> but to be able to see that took me 30 years. Mm. You know, it took me a lot of hardship, but I was always searching. So that attitude impacts your music in, in what way? I think now I'm less, I'm less attached to doing things the way that I want to do them. Hmm. I find more, I find, I don't view people as enemies. I don't view entities as enemies. Like I say, well, uh, the industry, because the way they want to do things, they they don't, they don't care about the artists and they don't want to do all these things. And so I want to be free and do all these things. And I'm like, well, what if I can go into the space and impact somebody's life? I said, I feel free within myself. Like I, because I choose to go into that space and I said, there's everything I do, whether even it's in my own process, even with what I want to do, it's just like there's things I like about it and there's things I don't like about it. And there's always a price, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I feel like, you know, at that point, what is the purpose of what I'm doing? And like I said, I can go in here and actually make a difference. With your music. Yeah. Hmm. And I said, my music's not just for me and to to try to make it and right climb yeah so you're trying to impact people for the better with your music i think so well i think it's working i told you out there like i feel your music different than other music out right now there's something very you get listen listen to this music guys it's it's very very different it's uh i i just feel it it's like it like penetrates yeah deep so i'm really glad to hear that there's good motivation behind it because i think there's a lot of music out there that doesn't have good motivation behind it you know yeah and i mean like you know for me it's when i hear it it's just it, it, i don't really put a cast of judgment on it i think you know do you think that is an issue in the music industry where people are putting kind of malintent behind their music to try to push it out to impact the masses negatively or is that not i don't something you see I, I don't I don't see it that way. Okay. I think I think that that might be what the end result is, but I don't think that that malintent is intentional. So it's the way people are perceiving it. I think, and so if they have negativity in them, it doesn't matter what music it is, right. they're going to find a way to right. make it negative. And of course, if you know, if this is the only music that's selling, mm. and you know, the industry is at a at a crossroads, and of course, you know, now that we're, I feel that as a society, we are talking about that. And we are uncomfortable with it. I, I believe that we're in the middle of a, a change. Uh, you know, it's the catalyst. I yeah. think the, the pandemic was a huge catalyst for a lot of people to start like asking themselves very, very different and real questions and things that really que question our purpose and existence. Mm. And so, you know, a lot of people in the industry will tell you they hate the um music that's spewed out especially things that push violence or and, and you it's know, not good it's not it's not good for the ears and I, I think i think we all can agree with that mm -hmm. but i think you know at the end of the day they still have to push it because it's like if this is what's selling mm -hmm. you know it's like i have to be able to keep my job 
I have to be able to keep these people on my payroll because if I if we don't bring this money in, then all of these people are going to not have jobs. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started to think about that part was like, it's a it sucks in like in that way. And it's like okay, it's like your morality may be doing this, like maybe telling you this, and you may hold these truths to yourself. But when you're walking into an industry that has, in order to make money, has you that's a doing tough. the antithesis of that, you yeah. have, and you know, that's just, that's a hard thing to walk, mm -hmm. you know? And so I don't- I feel like you, people get rewarded when they do walk that line though. Like when they, it might not be the easiest or the quickest path to success, but if you stay true to that and you listen to that, that voice in you and you feel that feeling like I shouldn't do that, and you don't, I feel like things work out better. Uh, well, I mean, it took me 30 years to get to this point. You know, a lot of people, they, they, I wanted fame so bad at like 20, 22, 23. Me now, I understand it's more of a byproduct than what I want. What I want now is peace and a life of fulfillment. Hmm. You know, what I what my success means to me now is much, it's radically different than what it was when I was younger. What so, does fulfillment mean to you now and success? I think success for me is agency of time. Fulfillment is knowing that I've done everything I could with my time. Damn, that's profound. Yeah. I agree. And and that's and really that's all we can do in life. Hmm. I think I think there's really no making it because you know, we all we all have to meet the maker one day. And so it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, during this time, like what do I do? It's like, I don't want to sit on my ass. Yeah. I don't want to be, I don't want to get a billion dollars and be like, okay, I get to retire at 30. I, I didn't right. come here to retire. I came here to work. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I came here to, to live. You can't just live just sitting down and doing nothing. Right. There's times for that. You know, there's earn a time it, for it. You earn it. Yeah. You earn it. Mm -hmm. And you know, now it's, it's, and I, I don't even know where, where it, the desire comes from and really it's just what i feel and i think like you know i get to experience this life i think it's more like i'm on a ride and i get to have choices on that ride you know i get to choose where i get to go and what i want to see i don't know why i want to make those choices but hmm. i know that i'm down for the ride and i want to enjoy it what do you think about the importance of kindness when interacting with other people i think i think it's very very important because you don't know what people are going through mm. but i also understand like there comes a point when it comes to kindness that you can get depleted yeah yeah you know and i mean i have work to do on the kindness you know part of my life like there are times where i'm eager to be kind and there's times where i'm so tired and you know my humanity is at this this level where i'm like i'm socially depleted mm -hmm. and i'm sitting there like i don't know if i have it in me today like the small talk and the yeah yeah, yeah the like, selfies and the yeah when people like for me it's really hard for me to be kind when somebody pulls out their phone before asking me and then starts recording me it's like i want to throw that shit and throw it on the roof <laughs> i want to do a it. song <laughs> And yeah, it is as horrible when people ask me for like a free shirt or, or something because I've been doing this for this amount of time. And I'm like, hey, man, I got people I got to feed right now. Mm. I think a lot of people don't, uh, people think that success is getting a lot of money or doing all these things. But really, like, it's about being able to provide for the people that helped you too. And it's like when you're, when you're in a winning position, you're officially starting as a provider. Hmm. If you're doing it right, I feel like, you know, I think that's the right attitude. It's just like, that's, that's what I feel now, even with, so, but I mean, that's a reflection too. That's where the kindness comes in. Even when I don't feel like it, if people want to record and do these things, it comes with it. Yeah. And that's so true. I have to, that's have, a mature perspective on it. It certainly does. <laughs> yeah. I can't have a, I can't have a position of entitlement hmm. and I have to remind myself a lot. I'm not glad do you that. do. Yeah. It's awesome, man. Well, what are you most excited about next? I mean, there's a lot, but what's what's your eye on? I'm I'm excited about life. I think what this opportunity really provided for me was faith is faith to continue. Hmm. 
is, uh, is the excitement to continue on the path. See where I can go next. I think for me, it's just being able to keep working and working and working. But not like in in the sense of, of like, let me be a workaholic and show up on the yeah. office and it's work your, for eight. It's your passion. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't feel like work. You almost have to monitor how much of myself can I give to this thing before like I have a breakdown because this is all I want to do. Right. Right? Is that and, what you're And I'm not even talking in the realm of music. I'm just talking about in the realm of life and the work that I have to do in life. Like who am I gonna become in five years? I'm excited. Mm. If I continue to do the work in my relationship, if I continue to do the work in my career. If I continue to do the work in business, if I continue to do the work as a son, like where does that place me in five years? Who will I become? Like if I wanted to pick up, you know, if I have another passion, if I wanted to become good at golf, what, it was because I love golf. So I was like, if I wanted to become good at golf and I practice golf and like where, how would that look in, the, in five years? Or hmm. if I wanted to, you know, learn how to fly a plane, which I also want to do or become a doctor, you know, these are still dreams of me. I don't think that, you know, it ends in music. There's so many things you can do with life, so many things you can explore. And so, you know, I feel like the world's at my fingertips in that way. That's amazing to be where you're at, still contemplate and grasp mortality to understand that that life is short and we need to do stuff like you're talking about. Man, this this is exactly the kind of conversation I would expect from someone who makes soul music and music <laughs> that sounds and feels like yours. You're deep. It's not I also don't want to give the the aura of rushing either. I love taking my time. Like I'll take two days to rest and, and to sort things out. If my body tells me I need to rest, I'm gonna rest. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad that I got the success now. If I would have gotten it any earlier, I feel like it would have destroyed me. That's so funny. People people always say that that have the breakout moment. They're like, it couldn't have been earlier. Couldn't mm -hmm. have been. Yeah, I'm happy for you, man. Thank you. Anything else you want to tell the audience? Leave leave anybody with? My goodness, I mean, I'm excited for the ride. Hell yeah. I'm excited for the ride. I don't know where it's going to take me. I don't know where it's going to go, but that's the gist of life. You got to be open and willing just to take that journey. And, uh, you know, life will bring you places you've never seen. Hmm. I always ask this of people that get to make a living off creativity in any form. Is there any message you have to people that know they're talented but don't know exactly how to get how to even start the path to where you're going and maybe they are too insecure to share their talent or just any, do you have any message to young artists? I think, and it, you know, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Mm. You do. And it's like, you know, you have to, you have to overcome that fear. There's a one thing that I forgot to mention for why, where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. My, one of my biggest fears in life, if not my biggest is loss. Whether it's the loss of a game, losing losing a contest, or losing a loved one, loss is one, that thing. And for me, I was afraid of entering this contest because of loss. But I couldn't stay where I was. And that was the hardship that I was dealing with with the car. It's like, I can't stay where I am. It's just gonna get harder, so you need to make a jump. Mm -hmm. It's like you either overcome your biggest fear and you jump, and you fail or you don't and you fail <laughs> like, so it's like if it's that the life you want is literally on the other side of that fear and i've heard it many times everybody on the on every podcast that i've seen anybody who's successful right now on social media they will all tell you the same thing the life you want is on the other side of that fear. No kidding. If you guys enjoyed that episode, you have to watch this one with Brandon Ferris, another extremely successful person who's kind and wise and will blow your mind. You'll enjoy it.